All right, we are in the book of Ephesians this week. We are going to be talking about pre-trib rapture scriptures in the book of Ephesians. And as I say at the beginning of each one of these, uh, the term there, tribulation, is never used as a title. It's always used as a description in your King James Bible. And I call these studies pre-trib rapture scriptures in Ephesians because people don't know if I say, you know, the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away, they go, what? You know, so I just use their terminology to debunk this post-trib system. So uh, let's start out here. We're going to see um, somebody comes along to you and they say, what would be the single greatest proof that you have for a pre-trib rapture? That's what they'll use. They'll use that term. Uh, a lot of people will turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 18, 16 through 18. Uh, that's not the strongest proof. You say 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 through 58. Nope, that's not the strongest proof either. John chapter 10. Nope, that's not the strongest proof either. You know what the strongest proof is for a pre-trib rapture? Ephesians chapter 1. The whole chapter. It proves conclusively that the catching away of the body of Christ happens before Daniel's 70th week or the time of Jacob's trouble. You can call it either one. The tribulation is not a Bible term. As, as far as a title is concerned. It's a description, but it's never given as a title. That's important, and I'll say it one more time. I have to repeat this and repeat this and repeat this. The tribulation, when you see the word tribulation, they'll try to, these post tribbers will try to make it into a title because you can see in different places here in the Pauline epistles, Paul talks about having tribulation. And so then they put it into the mind of the person through mind control, brainwashing. They'll say, see, because Paul says Christians have tribulation, that means that they'll go through the tribulation. That's how they lie. It's deception. All right? So what I'm doing is I'm using their term, but always prefacing this thing by saying the, ter the term the tribulation is not a Bible term if you use a King James Bible. The other ones from the Vatican, the, the new versions from the Vatican, I can't speak from the, for those, you know. NIV, ESV, MEV, NASV, you know, NKJV, whatever. They're Vatican versions. Uh, based primarily on the two uh, Egyptian, Alexandrian uh, Greek texts of um, Aleph and B, of uh, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. Another study. But let's start out here. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Did you get that? You say, well, how does this prove a pre-trib rapture? Think about it. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. You are predestinated as a Christian. You say, oh, I'm predestinated that I was chosen. I had no say in my salvation. God saved me against my will. Now, that's called Calvinism, all right, which is nutty nonsense. I am not a Calvinist. What's being taught here is when you get saved, your destination is fixed. You are predestinated there under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. Okay? You're going up. And we're going to see that in this chapter. That's the whole thing. I've told this story before. I'll tell it another time. And that is years and years ago, I had a, an older brother of mine was living in Alaska. And I flew to Alaska to visit with him and his wife and their children. Uh, so when I flew to Alaska, I just went straight to Alaska, right? From Pennsylvania to Alaska? No, we stopped in Chicago. You say, well, then you flew to Chicago, not Alaska. No, I flew to Alaska. That was where my destination was. You look at my ticket, it said Pennsylvania to Alaska. That's the final destination. We had to stop off, you know, a place or two there before we went to Alaska. See, in the, in the life of a Christian, when you get saved, your destination is fixed. You're going to heaven, whether you like it or not. <laughs> you're going to go to heaven, all right? Now, you're going to make a bunch of stops in between there. God's going to direct your life, you see? But your destination is going to be the same. My destination is going to be the same as your destination if you're saved, 
If you're not saved, then our destination is different. Okay? You don't go up, you go down. Got to check into that. Make sure you don't go down. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, now look at this, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. What is that? Brethren, it's the rapture. There is no time in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21, when dead saints go up. You don't see it. There is no gathering of dead saints in those three accounts in the Gospels. That's not in there. It's in the book of John. Interesting. John is the one who gets caught up in the book of Revelation chapter 4. John the disciple whom Jesus loved. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Seeing that here in a little bit. Hmm, how about that? Yeah, you see? You know, and these people, they'll, they'll, it's so funny, these post-tribbers, they'll go, oh, you know, to prove a pre-trib rapture, they got to go all over the place and, and take this verse and take that verse. Yes, that's called rightly dividing scripture. Okay, that's what that is. Uh, yes, we do go all over the place in scripture because there are literally hundreds of verses that can prove a rapture before the time of Jacob's trouble. We don't just uh, cherry pick a few verses out of the Gospels, cross dispensational lines, go before Jesus even dies on the cross and say, he's speaking to Christians. How could Jesus be speaking to Christians, Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, Luke 17 and 21, how can he be speaking to quote unquote Christians when he hadn't died on the cross yet? Do you ever think about that? Maybe you ought to read Hebrews chapter 9 sometime, verses 15 through 17, and see when the New Testament begins. I'll give you a hint. Uh, it's not Matthew chapter 20, or uh, Matthew chapter 1, excuse me. It's um, with the death of the testator. A testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Look it up. You say, I don't, I just, I can't believe it. Listen, stupid, look it up. And I call people stupid that are post-trib because people are either ignorant or they're willingly ignorant, and you've been deceived by Roman Catholics. That's what post-tribbers are. Post-tribbers are Catholics. You say, I don't believe it. Watch the video I just did before this one, okay? Uh, they're absolutely Roman Catholic. Even if they don't want to call themselves Catholic, they're believing that they have to suffer. They're believing that they're going to have to endure to the end to be saved and all this other stuff. Same thing in Catholics believe. And the Catholic Catechism teaches a post-trib rapture, as well as all the uh, Catholic Church Fathers. But you see it there, that he is going to gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Um, did you know that during the Church Age, the body of Christ is one? That's what we read over in Galatians. We talked about that in the last study. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. He's going to gather together in one all things in Christ. Now you show me that in the book of Revelation. Read Revelation chapter 7 sometime. You'll see that there are two bodies. And that they are washing their robes in the blood of the Lamb. They're not washed. They're washing their robes. It's a different setup. And these post-tribbers, they'll, they'll go into fits and they'll say, You're preaching a different gospel. I am preaching a different gospel for the time of Jacob's trouble. Faith in Jesus is still there. Don't get me wrong. Revelation chapter 4, 14, verse 12. Read it. Okay. Faith and keeping the commandments. Right there in that passage. Okay. Faith is still there, but there's the new thing of you can't take the mark of the beast. Okay. I'm not worried about taking the mark of the beast right now. Why? The Antichrist hasn't showed up. Number two, he can't show up till we leave. All right. See, I'm not worried about it. I'm not worried about losing my salvation. I would be if I was in the time of Jacob's trouble. But you see, in Revelation chapter 7, both Jews and Gentiles are separate now. They're two different distinct groups. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. 
See? The disciples are called Christians first in Antioch, Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And yet, what were they? They're Jews. Those Jewish disciples were called Christians. Guess what we're called today as Gentile Christians? Or even Jews today. We're called Christians by the lost world. Of course, they've perverted it so much, you know, it's hard to differentiate anymore between it, but you see what I'm saying. But uh, another one thing I want to look at here before we continue, verse 10 here, it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times. What is the fullness of times? Turn back to the book of Romans, chapter 11. I talked about this in the Romans study, but we're just going to hit it again. Because I find a lot of people just don't, aren't able to endure sound doctrine. There's a reason for that. Romans chapter 11, verse 25 through 27 says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, look at this, until the fullness of the Gentiles become in, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. You know what's amazing right now? The nation of Israel, you can go back in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 1, the nation of Israel is starting to wake up. There are rabbis that are coming out and publicly saying, we need to take another look at the New Testament and this Jesus guy. They're starting to wake up. Now the majority of Jews that are in Jerusalem, that are in Israel, the nation of Israel over there, the majority of them are going to accept the Antichrist. Absolutely. The majority of them are going to go to hell. They're going to burn. Being God's chosen people is not going to save them. All right, that's not what the text is saying there in Romans chapter 11. What the text is saying is, right now, the fullness of the Gentiles is still here. God is still, still taking it easy on the Gentile nations. All right, you look back in the Old Testament, God's just going in there and, and He's saying to the, to the Jews, to the children of Israel, He's going, hey, wipe those people out, wipe those people out, kill all of them, kill that. You know, he, He's just wiping them out. Why? God's dealing with one nation. All right? When they rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah back there in the first century, now the Lord says, okay, blindness in part has happened to Israel. Boom. They're blind. They're still looking for their Messiah. He already came. You know, but they're, st they're blinded. God's judgment is upon the nation of Israel. Still his chosen people, but his judgment is on them right now. You say, well, how's that possible? How can he have judgment and, uh, you know, still be chosen and think, well, did you ever read the Old Testament? You'll try sometime. You'll see it all through the Old Testament. Good king, bad king, whether there's a bad king, God's wiping out the Jews and wiping them out and stuff like this. And, you know, they're dying of plagues and all kinds of other things, but he doesn't wipe them out totally. Why? Because they're his chosen people. He has plans for them. But you see, this blindness has happened in them in part until God is done dealing with the Gentile nations. You know, America should have been wiped out a long, long time ago. Why hasn't it been wiped out? Or the UK, or uh, Australia, or Germany, or wherever. You know why it hasn't been totally just wiped off the face of the earth? Because there are saved Gentiles in it. That's why. Uh, is it going to be that way in the time of Jacob's trouble? No. In that time of Jacob's trouble, yes, there will be a great multitude that gets saved out of every people, kindred, tongue, nation. That's true. That will be there. But nationally, God's going to be wiping out these nations. The Bible says that He makes a full end of all nations, whether the Jews have been scattered. But He doesn't make a full end of them. You see? That fullness... That harvest, if you will, 1 Corinthians 15 talks about that. This thing of the harvest, that you have the first fruits, you have the harvest, and then you have the gleanings, all part of the first resurrection. Again, people get confused on that. They think the first resurrection doesn't happen until you know, the end of the millennium. It's when the first part of it happens. No, it's going on. It's, it's progressing. It starts with Jesus Christ coming up from the dead and Old Testament saints up with Him. Then it happens with the rapture. You know, the body of Christ being gathered together. Then you have the thing of uh, saints that die in the time of Jacob's trouble, as well as the millennial kingdom, coming at the, up at the end of the millennial kingdom. That's the first resurrection. All right? It has multiple parts to it. It doesn't, you don't wait for the resurrection until the end of the millennial kingdom. You say, how do you know? Well, because we rule and reign with Christ. 
the, the dead saints are ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ for the thousand year period there. Now, if they are resurrected at the end, how did they get there to rule and reign with Christ at the beginning? You see? <laughs> it's really something, isn't it? But God's just about done with the Gentile nations. And believe me, if you think, you know, oh, well, I'm just going to wait. You know, I don't really know if there's any proof for this whole thing and stuff. I think I'm just going to wait. I got a pretty good life here in America or wherever else you are, if you're Jewish or, or whatever you are. You know, I'm just going to wait. I'm going to see if this rapture happens. Then I'll know for sure. Let me tell you something. When the body of Christ leaves, especially if you are in a Gentile nation, uh, those Gentile nations are just going to be wiped off the face of the earth during the time of Jacob's trouble. I believe that America right now is still, uh, we still have, you know, all the blessings of God because of the Bible-believing Christians out there doing God's work. But man, oh man, <laughs> when we leave, you know, North America, Canada, and, you know, the United States, they're just going to get wiped off the face of the earth. I believe that. Uh, it's going to be bad for them. But anyways, let's continue. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 through 14. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. And this is the one, this is the one if you want to pin a post tribber okay, the one that at least knows their Bible somewhat, this is where you nail them. You want to talk about the strongest verse for a pre trib rapture? Right here. Verse 13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. All right? Right there. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. What happens if a sealed Christian takes the mark? Very simple question. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Back in Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11, it says, If any man takes the, the, the mark, worships the beast and his image, he'll taste of the wine of the wrath of God. So you can be sealed and have God's wrath poured out on you in hell forever? Smoke of your torment ascends up forever and ever? Look it up. Again, well, I just don't see it. Shut your stupid mouth and look it up. Don't believe me. Believe what's written here. It's not my interpretation. It's not my unique system of belief. It is what the Bible says. And if anybody's telling you different, differently than what I'm telling you here, they're the ones lying to you. You say, how do you know? Look up the scriptures. Can you read plain English? I certainly hope so. You know, you're sealed. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 through 11. If you take it, any man takes it, you go to hell. The two don't line up. It's that simple. Post-trib rapturism, or even the, the uh, halfway through the mid-trib thing, and all, it just, boom, it's wiped off the face of the earth. Right there. You want a verse for a pre-trib rapture? You're looking at it. But continue, it gets even better. Verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. You're a purchased possession. Again, I've covered this in so many studies. I, I'm not going to go over all the scriptures for sake of time. I've talked about it over and over and over again. Acts chapter 20, uh, God hath purchased, you know, the, feed, the, feed the church of God which God hath purchased with his own blood. We're purchased. We're his possession. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Then how could we go into the time there, into the time of Jacob's trouble, take the mark, lose our salvation, and go to hell? How does that work? Say, oh, this post-trib stuff, I, it's really a deep theological debate. No, it isn't. It's very easy to figure out. All you got to do is just believe the book you're reading. Instead of watching a bunch of lost, reprobate Roman Catholics lying to you, putting out videos, propaganda films like After the Tribulation. It's a satanic little film put out by a guy that hates everybody down there in Phoenix, Arizona. A little weirdo. Kill the, kill the president. Kill sodomites. Kill this. Kill that. You know, Nobody even listened to the guy if it hadn't been for him getting beat up by Border Patrol agents and tasered and things like that. Steven Anderson is who I'm talking about. But let's continue. Jump down to verse 17. 
that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That's something else I want to make a mention of real quick here. What about revelation? Oh, the pre-trib rapture is only a recent belief. Okay, let me ask you a question. Implantable microchips. Uh, the King James Bible is the only English Bible that says the mark is in the right hand or in the forehead. And everybody used to laugh at the King James Bible years and years ago, and they'd say, well, that's ridiculous, that's absurd, it can't be in the right hand or in the forehead. Now everybody's going, oh yeah, mark of the beast, yeah, it's in the right hand or in the forehead. It's an implantable microchip. That's what's going to be used to control buying and selling. People are already taking microchips. The mark of the beast isn't here because the beast hasn't showed up, but people are already taking these things. People will have already moved to a cashless system, buying food with the scan of the finger or with a retina scan, looking in your eyeball into the ATM machine and things. You see? Excuse me, not ATM machine. That's kind of redundant. You know, automatic transfer machine machine is what I just said. You know, the ATM thing at the bank there. Say it that way. <laughs> but you see, as we get closer to the time, something as ridiculous as saying a mark could be in the right hand or in the forehead, all of a sudden it's revealed. Hmm. And you know what I'm convinced of? The closer we get to the rapture, the more people are going to be pre-trib. Those that are truly saved. There's a dividing line happening right now. You see? You see, you have the teachings of Roman Catholicism, which line up with a post-trib rapture. The teachings of the King James Bible, which debunk a post-trib rapture and go completely against it. There's a dividing line and those that are post-trib, they get so screwed up in other areas and weird doctrines and all kinds of things like that fall apart. And, you know, I think it's, I know many of the brethren have said, and I've said it myself a couple times, uh, I think a lot of these people that are post-trib are actually right. They will go through the time of Jacob's trouble. They're headed for the tribulation time period, in other words. Because they're not saved. Let's continue. Verse 18, and you know, and again, somebody's going to go, I say salvation is believing in Jesus Christ and the pre-trib rapture. Oh, uh, well, you ought to read over there in the book of John where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And actually talks about being, you know, resurrecting the dead and living. Uh, Jesus is the rapture. Okay. Uh, that is when our salvation is complete. That's why Paul said in the book of Romans, now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. Jesus is our salvation. Our final salvation, when our body is redeemed, when this corruptible puts on incorruption, that's the rapture. So it's kind of a weird thing to say, I believe Jesus died for my sins, paid for my sins, I have my faith in Jesus Christ, but I refuse to believe in the rapture. It's going to go through the, we're going to go through this tribulation, we're going to go through it, and I might lose my salvation. There will be people that don't endure to the end. They're going to take it, and they're going to lose their salvation. You're making God out to be a liar. Are you really saved? Verse 18, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. I sure hope yours have been, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Our inheritance, brethren, is we're going to be in heaven with the Lord, but guess what? If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. We're coming back down to this earth. You know, it's really frustrating right now to see how wicked this world is and to see how the wicked are seeming to just be getting away with murder, literally. You know, well, guess what? We come back down to the earth and we rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years and we enforce his laws. That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? Verse 19, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and give, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Except for during the time of Jacob's trouble, because then, Part of the body of Christ will be in heaven and part's going to be down here on the earth suffering and the Lord's going to be up there going, oh, oh no, another one took the mark. Ugh. You know, he was part of the body. 
you know, the Lord's going to be like this, you know, he'll have a full hand, and all of a sudden, Christian takes the mark of the beast. Oh, he just lost a finger. Oh, no. A couple days later, oh, another one took the mark of the beast. Now he's down to three fingers on one hand because Christians took the mark of the beast. Oh, oh there went another one, and there went another one. Oh, no, he's got no fingers on that hand. Part of the body's gone now because they took the mark. They were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, but he had to unseal them and stick them in hell, even though he promised them that he wasn't going to do that, but he, he had to. He had no choice because Revelation 14 says that he would. <laughs> you see the absurd stupidity of the post-trib rapture system? You say, well, but, but I feel that it's come from some very reputable men. It came from Roman Catholicism. I went and knocked my other catechism on the floor. Oh, man. Probably going to have to do a couple Hail Marys now and Nah, it's okay. I don't like throwing footballs around. So, uh, not being very tolerant of other people's faith traditions. That's okay. I never have been. Never will be either. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Let's go there. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we had we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath even as others hmm this is for people in the time of Jacob's trouble uh no because if you're a child of wrath in that time period that's coming up if you've taken the mark of the beast and God's wrath is upon you you know Another one of the favorite little things, the funny little games that the post tribbers will play. They'll say the rapture or the uh, wrath doesn't show up toward till the end, so we can be there for the beginning before the words wrath show up. <laughs> you know, never mind the fact that God is bringing together all the nations and you know pouring upon them His indignation. It says back in Zephaniah three, it's talking about this. He gathers the nations and He pours out His indignation on them. That's not wrath because it doesn't say wrath. <laughs> Stupid, stupid bunch of nonsense. We were all the children of wrath back before we got saved. Sure, right now, there's not a thing that you can do that's going to keep you from getting saved. You know, if you're a sodomite, if you're a, a lying, thieving, murdering, whatever, you can get saved. Whosoever will. You know, come on, get saved. What are you waiting for? But not so in the time of Jacob's trouble. If you're a child of wrath, if you are following the prince of the power of the air in that time period and you take that mark of the beast, you're finished. You say, well, I, I, I shouldn't have taken it. I just, I, I didn't know what I was doing. You're finished. No chances? No chances. Nope. Sorry. Just one more chance? No. No. Sorry. You're in hell. You're going to burn forever. You see? Oh, but we have to make the whole Bible from... Genesis to Revelation. I've heard some of these wing nuts. You know, Mike Hoggard said that the one time. Genesis to Revelation. The whole book is for us. You're out of your mind. Or lost. Or both. Yeah, I, I want to just include everybody here, you know. Look at verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins... How's that going to work out in the time of Jacob's trouble? If you're dead in sins then and you've taken the mark, the rest of this doesn't apply to you. Hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know what? I'm in Christ right now. You're saved. You're in Christ Jesus right now. We're actually seated together in heavenly places with him. And I've often said this, my wife and I will talk about this sometimes, you know, sometimes it's like you're just here on the earth and all of a sudden it's just like, oh man, I just, I don't know what my problem is, I just feel so depressed, just so down today, I don't know what the deal is. Well, it could be a spiritual attack, or it could actually be the fact that you're feeling what God feels. Wouldn't that be something? We're seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He has a bad day. We have a bad day. Some evil things are happening down on the earth and the Lord goes, oh, man. you know, you read back in Genesis chapter 6, it grieved the Lord 
There are times the Lord's looked down at his creation and it grieves him in his heart. And he repents. He goes, oh man, I shouldn't, I shouldn't even made people. You know? Look at the context. The context determines what the word repent means. Of course, God's not a sinner. God doesn't need to repent of sins. But it repents him that he even made man. He says, I'd like to turn from that. I wish I hadn't done that. You know? But you can feel that sometimes as a Christian. Look at verse 7. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Uh, ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in us. Or grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus? Huh? Have you read the book of Revelation? Those are the ages to come. I mean, we're saved. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. All of a sudden, boom, the Antichrist shows up. And he's standing there. And, uh, you know, we go, oh boy, I guess there was no pre-trib rapture. To say for the sake of argument, I know it's stupid, but, you know, let's just stick with me here for a minute. Well, children, let's all gather around. Let's, let's pray because as we read through the book of Revelation and all these seven seals and seven trumpets and seven vials, children, that's God's grace and His kindness that's going to be poured out on us. Why? Because Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7 says so. The exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. We're heading into His kindness. <laughs> I mean, are these people crazy? You know, not one verse of Scripture to prove a preacher. You're out of your mind. I mean, Scripture after Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. All the way through. His exceeding kindness. Have you experienced His kindness? No matter how bad things get, Romans 8.28 applies to a Christian right now. Sure. Unbelievable. Verses 8 and 9 here. Let's look at this. As we continue, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What about the time of Jacob's trouble? There is an element of works. I mean, if I go down to the bank and I say, okay, I'm going to sign up for this special new system that's very intrusive or something, or I'm at the store and they have one of these self-checkout things or whatever else, and I, I go through and I say, okay, I'm going to sign up and I'm going to do my, my fingerprint scan thing I'm going to buy with my finger and I'm going to do a retina scan and whatever else, I'm not going to lose my salvation. Why? It's not tied to the Antichrist. I'll grant you that is Mark of the Beast technology type of stuff. It's biometrics. I think that that's what the, the Mark of the Beast is going to be. It's tied in with biometrics. Biometrics meaning that it's computer technology that's linked to your body. Uh, that's there. But I'm not going to lose my salvation if I do it right now. All right. When the Antichrist shows up after the body of Christ leaves, yeah, it's going to damn you. And uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 isn't going to apply to somebody in that time. And it's really sad because a lot of people are teaching this non-dispensational heresy and they're going to be right here for the time of Jacob's trouble and they're going to go on teaching from the Pauline epistles telling people that they are eternally secure and don't worry about it. This thing that you have to do, you have to do it. You have to provide for your own, don't you? You see? It's going to be a really interesting time. I'm glad I'm not going to be here for it. Look at verse 11, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made, made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Related to Galatians chapter 3, I think it is. Check here real quick. Yeah, Galatians 3, verse 28. Verse 15, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, Jew and Gentile, one new man, so making peace. 
and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to them which are, were afar off and to them that were nigh. In other words, them that are, that are afar off are the Gentiles. Those that are nigh, that are right there, that understand the promises and things, are the Jews. Verse 18, For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, unless you take the mark of the beast and then fall away and you're going to be lost. Oh, I'm sorry it didn't say that. Uh, it just says, fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. We're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. This destroys the whole post-trib system. It just wipes it right out. <laughs> Verse 20, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. You know one another reason I think a lot of professing Christians today have a very serious problem understanding the preacher of rapture as well as a lot of other doctrines? It's because they are in satanic, accursed buildings. Say, so, oh, now come on. listen to me. There is not one verse of Scripture that tells any Christian to build a building and call it a church. And you study the architecture, those things are pagan Greek Parthenons with a phallic obelisk on top that they call steeple. I showed it in the Independent Fundamental Baptist Catholicism studies, proven from architectural sources, from sources showing the history of these things. Bible-believing Christians down through the centuries never met in buildings. But part of Satan's conspiracy here in the last few hundred years, most of these Babel buildings were built by Freemasons. They are satanic Baal temples, phallus houses, Babel buildings. We have all kinds of fun names for them. I had a brother recently write and call them goat sheds. I thought that was pretty good. I like that one. Goat shed. Not a sheep uh, barn, but a goat shed. I thought that was pretty good. But you see... When you are under a cursed building like that, I mean, you know, I'm going to be a little bit graphic here, but just deal with it. Imagine if there was some kind of a pagan temple, and instead of a steeple on top, it was a large statue of a man's member. Would you walk into it? You say, well, of course not. What are you doing going into one that has a steeple on top? Well, brother, you see, but you need to quit making excuses for these stinking church buildings. They, there's just so many problems that go along with those things, brethren. I've been in them for years and years and years. The majority of my life, I've been in and out of these stinking church buildings. It's time to drop the fantasy of it. It's time to drop it. It's not pleasing to God. And I can show you, I can prove to you from history, and I showed it in my study, that the, that the Catholic Church is the one that sanctified pagan temples and brought them in as pagan Romans and said, okay, we're going to take that pagan temple and we're going to worship in there. And that's what you're doing, you Baptists out there and Methodists and whatever else, you know, what you want to be. You are worshiping in pagan temples. And you think that you can be in those places and that God's not going to have an issue with that. And all that you can do to cite proof of it is cite the great men of the past and things. Those great men of the past all had problems. And every single one of those great men of the past, their Babel building fell apart after they died, proving that it was a cult of personality. That's what the thing was. And a lot of those uh, great men of God, unfortunately, if you start doing the research, they're Freemasons. Members of the Masonic Lodge. That's why they're big temples were built. You say, what are you making such a big point? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, the people are the building. We're Bible believers in all matters of faith and practice. Do you realize when you're saying that and you're in a church building, you are lying before God? To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Yes, you are in sin if you're in a church building. You're in very grievous, very serious sin. And you wonder why you have problems. I'll tell you right now, I can testify, my wife can testify, I can testify with a lot of people out there that have written to us and things over the years and they've said, when I left the church building 
atmosphere. When I got out of the politics of the whole thing and all the little clicky little, you know, things in social gospel and come together for the potluck supper and the little community get togethers and all the events, when they left it, God blessed them tremendously. I know, I know Baptist preachers that were called to the ministry, they've gone through seminary, they're going through the whole thing and they get there, they got their church building and all of a sudden it's just like they start to see the truth about the church building thing, the past of it and everything else and it's just like they say, you know what? I cannot say I am a Bible believer in all matters of faith and practice and continue in this building. I know the history of these buildings. They're from the pagans. And, and see, it's not the same thing. People go, oh, what about the holidays? Listen, at the holidays, you can do the holidays and have Christmas lights and things like that and stuff. And some people say, no, I don't want to do it. Fine, whatever. Okay. But you can do those things without worshiping that ceremony, without worshiping that holiday. But people that are in church buildings, 100% of the time, they are worshiping their building. They're worshiping that cult that they're a part of. You need to get out of that. All right? If you want to be a Bible believer in all matters of faith and practice, then you better follow those, those words. All right? Um, yeah. You know, and, and my wife brought up that point. You know, there she's working over here at her computer. And, you know, the fact of the matter is there are people that will say, I thank God for this church building. Something that, that God never even instituted in Scripture and you're thanking Him for it. I see guys that, are, that I respect very highly and they'll stand up and they'll say, it's good to be in the house of God. You're not in the house of God. All right? You're in the house of God in terms of Christians getting together and the whole body, the, uh, verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. It's the people. It's not the building. You say, well, then we can still meet in a church building. Brethren, when are you going to give up the fantasy? When are you going to give up this thing? When are you going to submit to the fact of saying these things are pagan in their origin? They're pagan, brethren. They are. They just are. Look it up. You know, the reason, the whole reason I'm, I'm kind of rabbit trailing here a little bit from this study is because I see this thing of just like, you know, I, I, all through the Old Testament, it's like, give up your pagan idols. Give them up. Give them up. Give them up. Well, you know, I, I, I guess you're right. I, I'm in kind of, con, you know, conviction here. And are you going to give them up? No, but, you know, I am kind of convicted about. It. And God's just going, okay, wrath, boom. You know, he can't bless you if you have pagan idols. I can't tell you how many things we've burned here. You know, personal belongings and stuff like that because the Lord convicts us. What are you doing with a Hollywood movie in your, in your well, yeah, it's just to entertain. Get rid of it. It doesn't belong in there. Is that the kind of testimony you want to have when the rapture happens and people leave and they look on the shelf over there and they go, what's this? All about? You know, get rid of it. If you're in a pagan temple and you're going and you're doing the same things that the Roman Catholics do, you know, people look at that and they go, what is this? You know, and there again, I've seen some of the stuff with the Jews coming out and they're going, you know, I want to take a look at the New Testament and Jesus, but I'm not interested in this, in this Roman Catholic Christianity. You know why they think all Christians are Roman Catholics? Because all Christians act like Roman Catholics that are going to the Babel buildings anyhow. You know? I had a buddy years ago, just tell this little story here and then I'll continue with my study. I had a buddy years ago and he was witnessing and he was putting tracks on people's vehicles and some guy came out and said, hey, get this thing off my vehicle. I don't want you putting that on my vehicle and stuff. And my friend went over and tried to witness the guy and the guy was like, hey, I don't even want to talk about it. You know, just, just get out of here. You know, I don't even want you in the neighborhood, okay? You know, get out or I'm going to call the police. And my buddy said to him, okay. He said, well, let me just say one thing before I leave, and that is if you ever get saved, make sure you don't go to church. And the guy was like, what did you just say? And he said, if you ever get saved, if you ever want to come to the Lord and get to know the Lord, it's a personal relationship. It's not about some church building someplace. And the guy was like, I thought that's what you said. And he said, what do you mean by that? My friend got a chance to witness to him. Oh, we're just so ineffective as a church. We gotta, we just, we need revival. We gotta, it must be that our buildings that haven't worked, I mean, you know, there again, this experiment with church buildings. I'll get back to the study in a minute here. <laughs> our experiment with church buildings. Uh, we've put hundreds of billions of dollars here as American 
Christians and over in the UK and other places too, we put all this money, billions and billions and billions of dollars into church buildings. Then why is it more corrupt now than it was years ago? Why? Well, probably because we got to build more church buildings and bigger church buildings and we got to get more buses to go out there and do the routes and things. It doesn't work. Stop. <laughs> okay. Ephesians 2 verses 20 through 22. It's the people. And God's not going to be pleased when people are meeting in pagan temples. I mean, you know, Let's just go with that for a minute. Okay, let's let's have uh, let's have uh, First Baptist Church meeting at um, all night uh, stripper club or something like that. We'll just do it when the strippers aren't there. We'll just you know go into the thing and have the beer signs on the walls and everything else, and you know the poles and the stages and the platform and whatever. We'll just do that. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't matter where we meet. If the body of Christ, as long as the body of Christ comes together, it doesn't matter where we meet. Um, you wouldn't make that argument. And yet you'll meet in a pagan temple. Continuing. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 through 19. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named. Huh. The whole family in heaven and in earth. Uh, the dead in Christ. They're up there. Absent from the body. Present with the Lord. Family and earth, we which are alive and remain, we're a family. We're all one in Christ Jesus. How's that work for the uh, time of Jacob's trouble? When you are forced to live in a system where you have faith in Jesus, but you have to keep the commandments of God. Revelation 14, verse 12. Verse 16. Uh, let's see where I'm reading to here. Okay. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Okay? We're all one family. And the verse there about the verse 18 may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. I believe that that's a reference to, you know, you can make it a reference to the universe. You can make it, uh, I know Dr. Ruckman's got a really good study on that. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting study. Can't get into it here. It kind of goes uh, in a different direction. I've already gone too far in a different direction. Not too far, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, kind of stick with my subject somewhat here. But you see there, we are sealed. We are part of a family. Our destination is fixed. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. They won't be in the time of Jacob's trouble. I'm part of the body of Christ. If you're saved, you're part of the body of Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ is not a self-amputee. Oh, that one took the mark. You know, cut that finger off. Oh, there's another one. Break his nose off, chuck it. You know. See, you know, these, these post-tribbers, they're so good at staying away from just common sense stuff like that. They'll always go back and they'll go, the Bible says after the tribulation, it says after the tribulation, leading you to think that the time is called the tribulation as a title, which it never is. And it says after the tribulation, you know, and so that pr proves that Jesus comes after the tribulation. Well, Jesus does come after the tribulation of those days, but the sun, the moon, you know, are darkened and the stars, stars fall from heaven. Uh, where's that at in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 58, or 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 through 18? There's nothing about the stars and falling from heaven and the sun and the moon being darkened and things like this. It's not there. Crazy. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. There is one body, not two, like in Revelation chapter 7. And one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Not true for a time of Jacob's trouble saint. Not true. There's two bodies. 144,000. Then the great multitude after that. 
Read Revelation chapter 7 again. What's your interpretation? It's this stupid poster or pre-trib stuff. No, man, it's what the Bible teaches. Look at uh, verse 30, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You know the worst that you can do as a Christian is just going to grieve the Holy Spirit of God? It doesn't say, like Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 through 11, that if any man take the mark, the same drinks of the wine of the wrath of God, and they're tormented in hell forever and ever. It doesn't say that, just you're grieving the Lord. Hmm. I mean, where in the Pauline epistles does it say anything specifically to a Christian about losing it? Hmm. Next, let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Are the days evil right now? Yes. How much... Uh, time do you have? That hour hand there, it goes and it rings, chimes at the hour. You know what? That hour is never going to come back. That hour has gone. You know those hours that you spend wasting your time watching videos that have no profit? Those hours that you spend if you watch television, if you haven't kicked that habit yet, or if you do other idle things that are a waste of time? And I'm not against, you know, going out and taking a walk or something or, or just, you know, some casual types of things. That's fine. I'm not saying you have to read your Bible and witness all the time. I mean, take a break once in a while. The Lord did, you know. He didn't need to go out fishing on the boat, you know. Okay, take some time once in a while. But those times when you know that you should be re redeeming the time and you don't, it's gone. You see... That's another one of the things about the rapture, the pre-trib rapture. It makes you realize there's not much time left. So you decide, I'm going to redeem the time because the days are evil. You see, the worse things we're getting for the world, the closer we know we're getting to the Lord Jesus Christ taking us out of here and our work is done. They had this game show years and years ago, back when I used to watch television. And I forget even what it was called. I don't remember, but there was this booth that they'd put these people in. You win the game, you get put in this booth, and they have cash in there, and it and it blows this, it's like this wind tunnel, and the cash is just flying all over the place. And these people are frantically, you know, grabbing cash and sticking it in their pockets and grabbing more cash. Uh, that's a picture, a good picture of what we have as Christians. We only have a very short little life down here to earn those rewards. Grab for as many as you can. Redeem the time. The days are evil. And you know what's the neat thing about this? I know it gets really disheartening sometimes to be a Christian as things are getting worse and worse, but guess what? The darker it gets in the world, the brighter you can shine. The easier your job is. Isn't that neat? Yeah. The evil and corruption is getting so bad right now, it's so easy to document stuff anymore. I mean, you know, it used to be years and years ago when I first got saved and I started to find out about this, some of the New World Order type of stuff, this global conspiracy and world leaders talking about the New World Order. It was like this rare thing, you know, that every once in a while you'd hear somebody talk about. Now it's just like they talk about it freely. Oh yeah, we're, you know, one world government, yeah, we're going to bring all people together. and Yeah, 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 you know. What is that? Well, the days are evil and you can redeem the time by pointing that to that stuff to the lost world and saying, look at that. Hey, if you're saved, or if you're, excuse me, if you're lost, I'm talking to the saved a lot, if you're lost and you're watching this video, don't you think you ought to get saved soon? Don't you think maybe you ought to quit uh, playing games and get down on your knees and get your salvation settled before the Lord? You better do it soon. Not going to have much time left. Turn in your Bible to John chapter 11. So keep your hand there in, in uh, 
excuse me. Keep your hand in Ephesians chapter 5. I forgot to say that. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to do a little flipping back and forth here. Ephesians chapter 5 and then turn to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, verse 23 through 29. I read about this in the Romans study, but I just love this passage. It's wonderful. John chapter 11, verse uh, 23. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. That's all she knew about. But look what Jesus says to her here. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Our family in heaven, in other words. Verse 26, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Do you believe it, if you're a post-tribber? Do you believe what Jesus just said right there? You say, well, yeah, I'd have to. Be, you know, Jesus just said it. Okay, it says there, those that are dead are going to you know, be caught up there. You know, they will live again. And then if those who are, you know, those who are living will never die. They'll never see death. Now, please show me that in the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's not there. There's no resurrection of dead saints in any of those accounts of the second coming. There's a difference there. Jesus is speaking about some different event here. And check this out. Let's continue. Verse 27. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly. They say, there's no, there's no scripture for a secret rapture. You're reading it. Saying, the master is come and calleth for thee. Just beautiful tie-ins with this whole thing. It's amazing. Comparing scripture with scripture. John on the island of Patmos. He hears a voice like it were a trumpet. There's only two times that the word trump appears in the entire King James Bible. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The two rapture passages. Okay? I mean, it's incredible. John hears a trumpet, and it calls his name, and whoop, up he goes. We're reading about it here. The Master has come and calleth for thee. Look at verse 29. As soon as she had heard that, as, as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. And if you don't understand biblical typology, you're reading it right there. There are types, there are symbols, there are things like that in the, in the Bible. Of course, it was also literal. It's also there that she, she was sitting down and she rose up and she walked to him, of course. But there's an application as well there to what's going to happen at the rapture. You say, what does that have to do with Ephesians chapter 5? Well, uh, what did they say when Jesus Christ said about we got to go to see a Lazarus and stuff? He said, our friend Lazarus, Lazarus, sleepeth. What does verse 14 say here in our text, Ephesians chapter 5? Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest. Hmm. And arise from the dead. Interesting. Because the disciples, they don't understand what Jesus Christ is saying unto them. They say, oh, if, if our friend Lazarus sleeps, you know, he'll, he, he do well. He, you know, he's doing well there. If he's sleeping, let's go that we can also sleep with him. And Jesus talks to him, you know, looks at them and says plainly, Lazarus is dead. You see the tie-in? Pretty amazing. But let's continue. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. How can you give thanks for all things when you're going through the time of Jacob's trouble? Hmm. Well, praise the Lord. Look at that. The second seal is about to open. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for war and famine and death. Huh? <laughs> you know? The whole Bible just blends together. Yeah, if you're crazy. It's like saying all the liquids in my home blend right together. They all still stay as liquids, so it must all be okay to drink. I mean, I'll take some drain opener and I'll take some bleach or, or you know, some, uh, you know, gun solvent or uh, maybe some paint thinner and, and some, 
milk and some water and some orange juice and we'll just mix it all together. It's all liquid, isn't it? You know, you know, that's about what people do that are non-dispensational. But let's continue. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 32. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Um, I didn't see anything in there about a Christian doing these things. It's about Jesus Christ taking care of us, washing us, washing our sins away, washing us in his own blood. Is it going to be that way in the time of Jacob's trouble? No. Nope. They wash their own robes. Revelation chapter 7. Verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord to church. Paul, Paul is so confused here. Because if he really understood, you know, he, obviously he's writing as a pre-tribber. What a shame. Pre-trib fib and all that other stuff, you know. If he really understood post-trib doctrine, doctrine, you know, the historic position of the church, uh, he would realize there that uh, no man ever yet hated his own flesh. Well, that's not really true. You see, because in the time of Jacob's trouble, Jesus Christ pours out his wrath and his judgment on his own self, on his church there, on his bride his beloved bride there, you know, because she needs to be purified after all. And some parts of her gets cut off and everything else, you know, and so she shows up there kind of bruised and battered, although the text doesn't say that, you know, a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's not actually true. You see, you see why this stuff is just so stupid? All this post-trib stuff, you know, and, you know, oh, you should be a little bit kinder to, there are some things that do not call for polite, gentlemanly-like uh, attitude and language and things. Some things you have to rebuke sharply. That's what's going on right here in this study. And again, you know, if these post-tribbers, if these post-trib Catholics can convince you that you're going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble, it will lead you into severe depression. And it will take your eyes off of Jesus Christ and onto the world and you're going to start to prep. Absolutely. We'll be talking more about that in the future, too. But let's continue. Verse 30, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. See 1 Corinthians chapter 12 on that, too. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. We see it there again. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. When you get saved, you leave your father and mother. And you're joined to Jesus Christ. Hmm. What does the Bible say about the children of disobedience? The children of pride? That there's a certain being that is a father over all the children of pride? Hmm. It would be uh, Satan? What did we read earlier about the children of disobedience? The children of wrath? Yeah. You leave that. And who would the mother be? You say, well, okay, the father would be Satan. Who would the, the mother be? Well, there's a woman who's a city that reigns over the kings of the earth. So you see, when you get saved, father, your father is Satan. You're a sinner. You're one of his children, a child of disobedience, a child of wrath. You leave your father and your mother, the Roman Catholic system, the Roman Catholic whore that... Uh, teaches post-trib rapture, you leave that and you come to Jesus Christ and you get saved and you're now part of his body, his bride. You leave father and mother and you're joined to Jesus Christ. How about that? Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says here, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Absolute total lie. I'm sorry, Paul. Paul is wrong. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Why is that? Turn to Revelation chapter 13 sometime and read it. Uh, does the Antichrist have a body of flesh and blood? Yes. 
Well, then uh, how does this work out here? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Um, how does that work? How do you reconcile the two? I'll give you a hint. You can't. Why? They're written to two different groups. They will wrestle against flesh and blood. They will have to worship the beast and his image and take his mark in the time of Jacob's trouble. But we don't have to today. Nor will we. Because the Antichrist cannot show up until the body of Christ is gone. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. The body of Christ has to be removed. The bride has to leave. The family reunion in heaven. Do you get it? All of us in one in Christ Jesus, the exceeding riches of his, uh, I'm forgetting the thing here, the exceeding riches of his, I just went and forgot the, the word, wording of it. Ephesians 2 verse 7, excuse me. That, he, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us. Riches in his grace and his kindness toward us. Going through a lot of scriptures today. If you don't see the smoke coming out of my ears, I'm you know, sorry about that. Let's continue. But you see there the thing of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Uh, that doesn't work out. All right. If we are somehow going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble, then Ephesians 6, verse 12, somehow, how does that work? If we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, well, but there's the Antichrist. He's flesh and blood. Really, really messed up. Verse 13 through 17. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 through 17. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, I read that a couple times through, and I didn't see anything in there, any kind of a warning where Paul said not to take the mark of the beast. Don't you think that'd be kind of important if uh, we're going to go through it? Uh, well, it certainly would be, but you say, then what's the solution? We're not going through the time of Jacob's trouble. We won't be here for the mark of the beast. Pretty clear. Unless you're a post-trib Catholic. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 23 through 24. Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Do you love Jesus? Or do you love the appearing of the Antichrist? Turn to 2 Timothy 4 8. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give to give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. What is your affection set on right now? What is your love set on? Is your love set on this world and the things of this world? I've heard professing Christians say that. They'll say, I hope the rapture isn't this year. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I was going to get a new car this year and, and I'm up for a promotion soon at my job. And, and uh, Huh? Well, I hope that the rapture doesn't happen soon because I want to prove how tough I am. I want to prove that I can go through it and endure to the end. What? Yeah, you see, I've been, I've been building a, a survivalist retreat so I can survive the tribulation for seven years. I have stockpiled MREs and, and all this other stuff. I have a mountain retreat someplace and think... What? Have you been redeeming the time while you're doing that? Well, I haven't had time to. I'm trying to survive. I'm, I'm you know, I got to... I gotta survive soon. You see? If you love Jesus, you're gonna be out doing his work. I'm not talking about going out living a wicked life and just being sinful and things. Hey man, if you believe the rapture's coming soon, it's gonna purify your life. 
it's another lie the post-tribbers have come out with. They'll say, oh, pre-tribbers, you know, the pre-trib rapture doctrine makes people weak. Oh, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. If you believe that Jesus is coming soon, you're going to be really diligent to be found being faithful when he shows up. Not so that you can be saved or something like that, you know, no, no, but that you can be rewarded. Our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior. We're looking for Jesus Christ. We're not looking for the Antichrist. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you so much, Lord, that uh, we have such precious promises that our salvation uh, begins at Calvary and extends until the time that you catch us away from here, from this wicked planet, Lord, and, and uh, as it gets more and more evil, we're reminded that uh, you will be taking us out of here soon. And uh, we pray, Lord, for that day to be, to be nearer, Lord, and, and to come soon. And that we can get out of this place and and uh, just be together, Lord, and have the greatest family reunion that's ever been. I long for that time, Lord. I know that my brothers and sisters in Christ do as well. And uh, But Lord, until then, I just pray that you would help us all to be faithful, to stand by your word, not to stand by men, but by your word, and uh, that we would all be faithful in our witnessing and uh, just in our lives, Lord, help us to, to cleanse ourselves from from the wicked, vile things of this world. And if there are any things, Lord, that are in people's homes that they know that they need to get rid of, any kind of pagan idols, Lord, if there are Christians that are still going to these church buildings, I pray, Lord, that they would consider your word and consider what they're being part of and that they would get out of that system. And um, I just pray it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. <laughs> That's going to be it. Um, Definitely have a lot of things going through my mind right now. It's just amazing. Uh, I never did this study before um, in all the years I've been saved. I've been in this pre-trib, post-trib debate thing for many, many, many years. And I'll tell you what, it's just like you go over the classic passages, you know, 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You go through all this stuff and it's just like you debate it back and forth and back and forth and it's like, you know, they always, you know, these post-tribbers are always putting you down saying, well, you don't have many scriptures and things. Brethren, when you actually understand the argument and you start to look at the Bible, it's all through the Pauline epistles. I mean, this study has been a great blessing to me. I know it's been a blessing to a lot of you. Uh, not because of me. Not because I'm some great speaker or orator. I proved that today. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's, it's a great study because the Holy Spirit shows us these things from His Word. I can't tell you how many times I've seen in the comments somebody says, Yeah, it's weird. I was just reading through that passage and I thought, I wonder if that's what is going on here. Watch the video and it's just like, whoa, right there it is. You know, I, you know it comes through my mouth, the thing that the Lord showed to you. You know, fellowship of the Spirit. That's something that the uh, Catholic post-tribbers don't have. Unless they're devil spirits, they might be able to fellowship a little bit. I don't know. Uh, I tend to stay away from that stuff. So, But, uh, you know, I just want to close with one final thought on this whole church building thing. I know a lot of people are like, oh, I'm so sick and tired of him you know, harping on that. Uh, well, you're just going to have to deal with it because I'm going to keep harping on it. Um, you will find a blessing for getting out of that system where you can tr truly say now, I am a Bible-believing Christian in all matters of faith and practice. Yeah. These pagan buildings have no basis in Scripture. These pagan buildings go back to Roman Catholicism. And it's these pagan buildings where people are going to go to worship the beast. They should have no part in a Christian's life. And I'm going to give you a little thought, leave you with a little thought here. What if the Lord is waiting till the Christians, those that are truly saved, are totally out of the Babel buildings? So that the legacy that we leave behind for the Jews that are now looking, that are starting to look at the Bible, starting to look at the New Testament, and they're going, I mean, th think about this. Think about the testimony that the body of Christ has right now. You get an Orthodox Jew, and he's over there in Jerusalem, and he lo looks at the Bible, and he goes, I read the whole New Testament, but I don't see these practices of these Christians in the New Testament. Is that Jew going to get saved? If he looks at your Babel building... 
with your nice suit and tie and your nice dress and things like that, husband and wife couple there. He looks at that. He looks at Catholicism and he goes, it's pretty much the same thing. You see? See the problem? What if Christians all met outside of these Babel buildings, meeting in their homes and their daily life was a continuous worship of the Lord Jesus Christ, not just on Sunday and Wednesday night, but their lives were different. That's what's going to convince the lost world, especially the Jews as their eyes are now being opened. We need to get out of those buildings. I'm out. Won't be going back. My wife's out. Our son's never been in. <laughs> Neither will he be. Uh, the body of Christ needs to come out from that pagan practice of church buildings. They really do. There's just no support in Scripture for it. So that is going to be it. We will see you next week as we continue our studies on preacher rapture scriptures in the Pauline epistles. Uh, really enjoying this this uh, study. I mean, I I get a lot out of it as well. You know, I mean, I'm looking through and I'm just like, wow, the Bible's just crystal clear. We're leaving before the time of Jacob's trouble. Be found faithful, doing the the Lord's work when He calls us. That's it. Thank you for watching.